Wow. I can't beat that. Uh, okay, thanks, Scott. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. It's great, great to be here today. Great to see some friends and the list there on, online. Um, I, you know, I do a similar one of these meetings uh, Tuesday nights at a, at a place called In the Rooms. That one is supposed to focus on chemsex, but it's the same format. And in that, in that forum, and recently, lately, um, there's been some relapse and people kind of acting um, astonished that they were kind of struck by a relapse, uh, that it just kind of happened out of the blue. And I thought it might be useful to just kind of um, quickly summarize what I call the backward steps um, of addictive behavior, right? Starting with the relapse and then kind of working backwards to kind of stage it out and see, see what kind of things um, we do. And, you know, just as, just as recovery is not an event, it's, not, it's a process. And, and a relapse in our addictive behavior are also a process. So it really, and acting out, uh, any kind of relapse, any kind of slip, any kind of acting out really starts with triggers, right? And we, we've talked about triggers before. They can be external, they can be internal, they can be between people, um, and, and they can be different kinds of things. They can be some of those conditioned responses. And we know that with sex addiction and chemsex and porn, uh, those conditioned responses are extremely deep. It's automatic. We, we can start uh, to have sex or masturbate and be minding our own business, and all of a sudden, we're off in a, in a fantasy that we don't want to be messing around in. Uh, our brains just kind of go there automatically. Triggers can, can happen from unpleasant feelings, from unpleasant thoughts, from unpleasant physical sensations, uh, a, a, a contact from somebody, an affair partner or a using buddy just out of the blue, um, pressure from others, conflict with others. You know, after an argument, uh, after a stressful situation like paying bills or, or a phone call that is unpleasant, um, even and after positive things too, after socializing, we may uh, be at, a, at an event, <laughs> If we ever do those again, uh, safely social distance, let me just say, and mask. But uh, we may feel that when we get home that there's somehow we, we said the wrong thing and we start to like replay the tapes and, and think, gee, I was a really idiot when I said that and you know, blah, 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 and start to, to bring us down. So, so all those things kind of be triggers and cues and, and there's something that we just can't escape in, in addiction. They're, they're there. We can avoid a lot of them if they're external, but some of the internal ones are gonna bubble up and we just have to kind of learn how to diffuse them, how to deal with them. But those triggers can start to set off the what I call phase two, which is that euphoric recall stage. Well, gee, you know, I'm kind of having the sensation, I'm re remembering this past experience um, with my drug of choice or with the behavior. And, and I'm thinking about the, the, the good times, the, the, the positive memories, the times uh, it didn't work out maybe so disastrously. And, and we selectively overlook the, the bad stuff, the negative feelings, the remorse, the shame, the consequences, you know, all that kind of slips into sort of this foggy mist while we're, we remember the, the, um, the dopamine rush, frankly, is what we're remembering, that, that big punch of dopamine that made us feel euphoric and good. And, and that kind of, that's the brightest light in the room, right? And all the negative stuff about those relapses is kind of fade away into the mist, but, but we are remembering the good stuff. And that, that kind of starts to set the seed. And by the way, any time on this process, and there's five of these stages I'm gonna talk about, um, the longer we indulge in these, the, the more inevitable it is we're gonna use. So that we have the most control and most power to, to detach from this whole chain of events this earlier, better. You know, that when we deal with triggers and cravings and cues, that's when we have real power to do something about it. The more we, if, we, if we're starting to play around with you for recall in our heads, then we're starting to get into sort of a, a little bit of a dance that, that really could get us in trouble. Then to the euphoric recall, I feel like a, a cooking show, we, we're gonna add a pinch of, um, of unhelpful thinking. You know, and what does unhelpful thinking look like? It, it's, it's what we call um, cognitive errors, uh, you know, catas we catastrophize, we minimize, we rationalize, we, we uh, become entitled, we rationalize, gee, well, if, if only X, Y, Z would do ABC, then I wouldn't have to do this. Uh, or if only my whatever had said this in a nicer way, then I wouldn't just feel so angry and I wouldn't have to you know, deal with it. So we, we kind of uh, take these situations and really kind of twist them a little bit. And then we start to have this self-talk, right? There's a little, this voice in our ear, things like, you know, it really doesn't matter, or I deserve it, or only have one, uh, or only smoke a little, um, or only look at porn as opposed to something else, as if that's not a problem if you're a porn addict. 
um, or it's been a long time, that what, whatever we tell ourselves. And I think each of us who's been in an addictive process can, knows what our favorite phrases are and what, what kind of our pitfalls are. So really encourage you to become, become familiar with those. Um, or I can't, some of it, it's just, I can't stand any more of this. It's gonna be awful. And this happened last night where people were talking about the irresistible urge of a methamphetamine pull. And we had a, a guy who's a regular attendee who's a physician who was also in recovery from amphetamines who was saying, you know, I know if I can just sit through it, it's very uncomfortable, it's horrible. It feels like it's gonna be, you know, unbearable. And it, but it does fade, it does start to go away. And it, if we can just not hook onto it, those triggers and cravings, as long as we take an action, I think we have to call somebody, we have to get up and move, we have to get to a meeting, we have to do something. But I think we can, we have the power to diffuse them. We're not gonna be a victim to it unless we choose to. And then, then the fourth stage of what I call the tyranny of the shoulds, we start to really kind of uh, think about it. it. It shouldn't be so hard. You know, I shouldn't have this problem. Uh, she shouldn't speak to me that way or he shouldn't speak to me that way or uh, the world stinks uh, or, or the nevers. You know, nobody ever really gets sober from methamphetamine or nobody ever recovers from sex addiction or nobody or everybody really looks at porn whether they say they do or not, that kind of stuff. We just start to, to rationalize it in a way. And then finally, the fifth stage before that ultimately lets us is planning and preoccupation. At this point, our brains are on fire. We are having these um, very strong like go, go, go signals from that limbic system in our brain that just can't shut off and it becomes consuming. And we start to think about it. We start to maybe plan for it or think about when we might have time or even if that's not conscious, how many of us have, um, had an opportunity sudden, suddenly open up. You know, the addiction is very opportunistic, right? We, I mean, suddenly, um, you're nobody. You're not accountable for an afternoon, and suddenly you have four hours of free time, which can turn into a five-day relapse. But but you know, we have this these moments when we can uh, fill the gap. So so my point in this kind of dissect this very long stage of build up to the actual relapse. And so really take those into account. If you find yourself at any one of those stages along the way, uh, we still have the power to, to interrupt that process. And really it's only us that can interrupt the process with taking action by calling, uh, by, by getting to a meeting, by journaling, by doing whatever you can uh, to, to really try to interrupt the process. And by the way, I think um, sometimes, and this is my, I'm, cerebral, I think, like a lot of us. And I, so if I'm uh, in those moments of like uh, crazy thinking, my first thought is like, well, gee, why is this happening? You know, the, the why. The why is not so important at that moment. Uh, what's important at that moment is action. And you can figure it out later, but you really need to do something and, and uh, get yourself out of that space. So I think I'll stop there. So, thanks, Scott. Thank you, David. Real quick, can you just walk through just the five stages real quick? Uh, and then I want to ask you a question. Yeah, you bet. So the, the first stage, and these are just kind of how I cut the pie. There, there's different ways of conceptualizing this. But the first stage I, I would call triggers, so whether it's external, internal. So triggers, then the euphoric recall. We start to like that kind of plants a seed and we, we hang on to it. Um, and then uh, uh, I lost my food. There's the, then the unhelpful thinking, the cognitive errors, the, the generalizations, the jumping to conclusions, um, and then the, the preoccupation and planning, um, and then the, the actual acting out that happens after that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then um, the question I wanted to ask is, uh, and this is what I kind of what I do with uh, people I'm working with if, if there's uh, a relapse, is I try to walk them through these backwards as, as we sort of do the autopsy of what happened. Right. So, okay, we start with acting out and, and then we go into when did, you know, when did you start planning and, and getting preoccupied and what did that look like? And then we go, you know, to the cognitive errors, the shoulds, the nevers, the whatevers. Um, and, and then we go back to euphoric recall and, 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 and then back to triggers. And sometimes we realize that, that, that the relapse started weeks before. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, well, somebody said something in a meeting and it triggered me and then I got mad and then blah, 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 you know, and, you know, and that was weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, totally. It can last a long time. That, I guess you call it a tail, right? That tail that goes way back uh, can be weeks. Absolutely. So can so, the plan. And I encourage anybody who, 
relapses or has had a relapse to actually do this exercise, but to you know work backward until you get to the trigger that kind of started this, because in the future, you'll be more aware of that trigger and less likely to relapse off of it. Um, you know, you can intervene. When you know what your triggers are, it's easier to intervene. Um, if you're past the trigger and into euphoric recall and cognitive errors, you know, the boulder is rolling down the hill and it's tough to stop it. Right. So um, we have a bunch of questions today. Um, so let's get to them. So keep them coming in. We'll get through the ones we have for sure. Um, my husband is supposed to be working on the full disclosure. This is full therapeutic disclosure, I assume. And I just realized he hasn't been doing that work. When I reminded him about it today, he asked if I was filling one out too. I am shocked, confused, and furious. Is this a common issue? Um, is it denial or just more blame? I was hoping that with the way the form is worded, um, the process would help him find a little empathy. So far, no such luck. Um, how can he ask me this? Okay, so uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the, just quickly, the uh, disclosure is the, the point at which the uh, sex addict reveals to his partner or wife or husband uh, the uh, details uh, in, in, not in a harmful way, but in just the general scope of, of the acting out behavior. So the partner can, can understand it all and have a kind of a clean slate. So it's all out on the table uh, in, in a very healthy way. And it's, it's a very scripted process. It's a very formal process. The addict works with a therapist. Usually the partner works with a therapist and these, the four of them come together at this very formal meeting, there's a little bit of exchange of documents among therapists beforehand, and the partner can ask questions. And so it's a very scripted um, and helpful process, by the way. Um, so um, it's the partner's duty to disclose. That's 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 uh, the cheating partner. Right, the cheating partner, sorry, um, to, to, to reveal that the, what they've done, but right? it's not a, a, a job or a burden on the, the uh, affected partner, the, the traumatized partner, if you will, to to have to do that or even defend what they've done. They, they have the opportunity to ask questions and to um, get a satisfactory response from that. So it's very unusual uh, to, to kind of project it back on the, um, the, for the addict to project it back onto the partner. That's something that um, is not said very much. I think um, the, the, the idea of doing a disclosure is of course very threatening. Um, it's a central focus uh, of a lot of the guys that come through treatment, obviously, because they're sometimes their marriages depend on it. The healing, uh, everybody recognizes it as a big as a big deal, and I think it can be pretty um, tough to put together something, and, and maybe even tougher to present. But I think it's one that has to be done with the spirit of healing and not denial or confrontation or blaming or projecting or anything else. Right? It has to be uh, done with the spirit of how can we uh, really work on this to to have a new, uh, uh, as fresh a, or a clean a slate as we can have uh, in moving forward and healing the relationship. And so um, uh, that's how it should happen. You know, when it doesn't, I think um, there's some, when there's some resistance, I think clearly this is often happens in early recovery, sometimes a couple of months into um, when after sobriety has begun. And I think sometimes people um, still have uh, little breakthroughs of denial or resistance or a, a lack of empathy. And remember, I think when people are defending themselves, I'm talking about the addict here, um, get, and it's not even a conscious process sometimes, but they're feeling like the need to defend themselves, feeling vulnerable, uh, sometimes that, that empathy can kind of dry up. And, and those, are, those are little, um, tiny little baby skills sometimes in an early recovery for the, for the sex addict and porn addict, that empathy is something that, and if, actually for chem addict, chem sex addicts too, the, the empathy that is replaced by the objectification of everybody in the addict's world. And, and to really learn that and to really kind of uh, practice empathy is something that, that's uh, a relatively new skill sometimes. And I think under stress, it can kind of evaporate. So I would hope your partner, uh, that the addict is in therapy and how it can get some assistance for this and that you also have a support system where you can talk about how to respond to these kind of situations because um, the, 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 the process, the disclosure process itself is a really healing one and a healthy one, but uh, I don't, I'd hate to see it derailed by something like this. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, the disclosure process should help him find some empathy, um, but he hasn't gone through the disclosure process yet, so he may not be there yet. 
Um, I, I just put a book in the chat feature, Courageous Love by uh, Dr. Stephanie Carnes, which is a really good book about the, the full therapeutic disclosure process. Um, it tells you exactly what should be happening and when and, and what each of you should be getting out of it. At any stage, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a little worried about that they're filling out forms and um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe this came from some website or something. <laughs> there are no therapists involved, so please don't do this without therapeutic assistance. Um, so um, my sex addict's birthday is on Saturday. Uh, he said he offered to work on Saturday from noon to four. I am triggered by this. Normally he doesn't offer to work for someone. How can I bring up that I am triggered without starting a fight? Um, my intuition is on high alert. Thank you. Um, Great question. And, you know, I think that intuition is an important feature. Uh, it's not always correct for most people, but it's a, it's a really good indicator that uh, some part of us is picking up on something. And so I think really the, the healthiest way to do that is just really a direct uh, communication, uh, just a, and a direct inquiry. And, and I wouldn't confront, I wouldn't assume, I would just, uh, uh, you know, the, the phrase I, I like, and I know Scott's model there too, you know, when you do something, it makes me feel something. And so I think, you know, when you offered to work on your birthday and you never do, it made me uh, concerned, uh, something like that. I just think a direct, a direct way to do it without uh, making the, the statement too complicated and full of other kinds of things and concerns. I'll I just keep it as direct as possible and see. Um, and, and is it reasonable for this betrayed partner to ask for maybe um, the cheating partner to check in while he's at work or take a picture right. showing himself at work between noon and four on Saturday? I mean, is that reasonable? I would say yes. Um, I think what one of the, the third part of that phrase, by the way, is to kind of ask for some kind of behavior request or a change or a verification or something like that. You know, this is what I would like. This is what will be helpful for me from you. And, and something like that would be, I think, would be. Yeah. yeah not as, we, as we rebuild trust, when my trust issues are triggered, um, maybe you could do something to reassure me that you actually are working from noon to four, such as checking, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Um, it's not so it's not blaming. It's just saying, hey, my my trust alarm is going off. Can can you help me help you rebuild trust with me? Um, with that, that a lot right. of help me help you help help help. Um, OK, what is the break, best way to break through the addict's shame and denial, assuming that individual refuses to go to rehab? Um, I'll just quickly add the best way to break through shame and denial is to go to rehab because that's one of the main facets of rehab. And with that, I'll turn it over to David. Yeah, well, I would just endorse what Scott just said too, is that rehab is a place where uh, all the distractions of the world are kind of, try to re we try to neutralize them and then create this safe little container where people can um, do their work. And sometimes that means, um, you know, breaking through the denial with, through confrontation, through awareness, through peers, through seeing other people go through it. I mean, it's, it's a very helpful process. Outside of that, I think um, denial is, you know, can be really deeply rooted in our in our whole lives. We we build we often have years of preparing our denial systems, right, to defend our addictive behaviors and to keep um, people from getting too close. And so I think it's more difficult outside. But I I think uh, discrepancies, pointing out discrepancies, is a real key way to break through denial. Uh, just pointing it out. Now I will say one of the the problems is that a partner is not always the best person to start to do that because it can quickly devolve into fighting and arguing, although partners are critical because they often see stuff that no one else can see or understand. And so I think just, just be straightforward. I think one of the ways um, can, that can be helpful is to set objective things like boundaries. Uh, you know, when you, these are the, what you're gonna do, what you're gonna spend, what, where you're gonna be, who you're gonna be with, that kind of thing, and, and have it uh, to be somewhat verified as possible. Uh, but I think, it takes really some confrontation and, and oftentimes, frankly, for the addict, uh, it takes some kind of consequence. And, um, and that usually is externally imposed and that oftentimes does kind of crack that, that shell you know, of, of denial. I, it just, I've seen it, well, I've lived it myself firsthand, but I've seen it in, in so many clients over the years too. When people are in this um, active addiction of sex or porn or chem sex, they're really in this kind of obviously they're an altered state, but, but there, there's, uh, 
they're in a kind of a bubble that that disconnects them from realizing some of the impact they're having, and, and that's really that denial. So a huge shell that uh, often in treatment, when that when that breaks open, we see them start to you know feel feelings and develop empathy and have sadness and realize, my God, what what did I put her through and all those kinds of things. It's hard to replicate outside of treatment, but I think boundaries. Um, Feed, feedback, honest feedback, confrontation as appropriate. Um, Scott, anything else that you would say about that? I mean, there's... Yeah, you know, there's some exercises in uh, this book, uh, Sex Addiction 101, the workbook, um, which I highly recommend um, that deal with denial, um, you know, uh, working through the, you know, the first section or two of, of this book, working through the whole workbook would be helpful. But, you know, the first like 30 or so pages, um, is heavily focused on breaking through denial. Um, so you may want to pick up a copy of that if the addict is willing to maybe work that or sign up for one of our online work groups. Um, but um, you know, there it, it's addicts. We need feedback from other addicts. Um, you know, I'm not going to listen to my mother when she tells me I have a problem, but I might listen to somebody else who has the same problem. You know, I don't have a wife, or I would have used a wife as an example, but. Um, so yeah, addicts need to be around other addicts with the same problem um, who are working on that problem. And, and I'd also say, I think shame is slightly different than denial. I mean, they're both aspects of, of addiction, obviously, but I think um, addicts often experience shame, well, they experience shame a lot internally almost all the time, but, but oftentimes there's that phase of an addictive cycle where afterwards there's a, there's a little moment of shame that, that, um, that can really uh, occupy the person's days for a while. But what I was going to say about that is that shame um, can often be uh, create a, this little window of opportunity when, when the addict is teachable. Right? And I think there are, there are these moments when uh, we realize as an addict, you know, what, what I've done, what caused, what harm have I caused, you know, what consequences have I experienced, um, and gee, what, what might I need to do about this? And I think the, the, the denial system is kind of cracked open a little bit by those moments. And and it's a it's a teachable moment. It's a it's a window of opportunity for intervention. But those close up again. I think as people get to feel better, you know, four or five days later, they their bodies have recovered, their minds have recovered. They're kind of back again, and and they're not as teachable as they were. So there's there's moments. They're not all equal. And so I think we have to really time um, our feedback sometimes to really fit when the the addict can hear what we're saying. Yeah, and and addiction recovery is always a process of two steps forward one and a half steps back um you know we learn something and then we put ourselves in pain again and then we're willing to learn again and then we put ourselves in pain again and then we're willing to learn again um so yeah it it, it doesn't happen in a smooth straight line um it's herky jerky and back and forth and um yeah and and if you're trying to help with that timing is is crucial as david said right right so. Um, so happy to discover a session like this exists. I'm a big fan of your book, David. Um, 90 Days Clean from Matthews here. Congratulations. Um, I'm grateful to have significantly fewer drug cravings and absolutely no libido, which you can address that, David. Um, when sexuality and erectile dysfunction, not dysfunction, erectile function return for me, what advice do you have for reincorporating sex into my life? Um, my meth use was exclusively coupled with porn addiction. I know how to steer clear of porn, but uh, sex is sex. Um, I assume actual person sex, uh, especially triggering too. It's a lot packed into that. Yeah, great question. And first of all, congratulations on that. 90 days of clean for meth is a big deal and uh, it's a hard recovery. So that's wonderful. And I'm glad you're finding the book helpful. You know, um, very often because of uh, any addiction that's that has this high stimulation of dopamine and that includes sex porn meth uh any amphetamine really combined with sex especially it's like supersized uh and that really kind of hijacks um our our uh, arousal and desire and and kind of a sexual arousal template what we're what we find attractive so the whole thing kind of skews everything and 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 hide when i say hijacks it, it resets the baseline of stimulation so high that normal kinds of Things. I mean, normal sex, normal sexual arousal doesn't even hit the hit the mark to, to register. So uh, very often when we uh, get into recovery early on from any of those addictions, there's a period of adjustment when our brains are kind of having to re 
readjust back down to normal kind of human scale level of stimulation that we can find arousing. But in the meantime, we're not finding much uh, arousing. And I think that's, that's the libido, the lack of libido that you're talking about. And that, that's a pretty common phenomenon is that because nothing, unless you go back to your um, kind of meth porn or, or porn in general, perhaps is gonna do that again. Uh, and so I think that's, that's a, a kind of a temporary phase where I've seen meth addicts um, get stuck in that phase where they can be, you know, six months clean, nine, a year clean and no return of libido. Uh, what I think they're often doing is um, when they're having sex, masturbating or having sex with a person, they, they are automatically, and it is not a conscious process, their brains are going to those meth fantasies. It's, it, because we, we call them deeply grooved, right? We, it's like when you, um, if you do something over and over again, you start to do it automatically. Uh, and I use the example of they have, you know, an animal that knows how to get back to your house or a cow that goes back to the barn. I mean, you're not thinking about it. Uh, I show a little video to the client sometimes that talks about when you first learn to drive a car, it's the gear shift and the gas pedal. And you have to really consciously um, be aware of everything and consciously doing stuff. After a while, you learn how to do it. You're not thinking about it. You just, you just do it. And your brain is exactly that way with these very high stimulation scenarios that come with, with sex addiction or porn addiction or chem sex, it's very attractive and our brains just go there. And so if we're not really on guard, and if I recommend taking a little break from sex, in fact, just to not be so vulnerable with that trigger, but you'll find yourself suddenly in a meth fantasy. You may not use, be using meth, but you may be thinking about meth porn or meth, a meth scenario or the meth high. And I really encourage you, and it's very hard, but I encourage you not to go there, not to use that fantasy to, and it's very frustrating, especially if you have no libido, if you want to have an orgasm or want to be able to perform with somebody, sometimes that's the fantasy you have to go to, to get aroused. And you're really just slowing down the whole recovery process if you do that. I encourage my clients to really try to find other ways to get that dopamine, other ways to find that sexual arousal, and to frankly understand that it's not going to be a meth kind of fantasy. You know, which is, is this high dopamine release followed by that terrible crash and depression. And, you know, it's unsustainable. Our brains and bodies are not meant to do that. So we have to kind of relearn how to enjoy um, sex without the altered state. And, and if you talk to long-term recovering people in meth, and meth addiction, they rediscover and, and actually say, yeah, it's different, but it's better. It's better because they're actually connected. They're aware of their feelings. They're, they're in there. So um, that's a, a huge topic I could talk about for weeks in, in a few minutes. Um, the other thing I just want to mention, porn, absolutely no, stay away from porn. Um, because that's, especially if you've, if you've paired that with, with meth sex and that high, that's going to be a really huge bond that is going to take some work to disentangle if you can ever disentangle it. So I'd be really cautious about that. The problem with other kinds of uh, behaviors, other sex, um, sexual behaviors is that you could really easily slip into that kind of meth fantasy I was talking about. So if you can just really be careful of that, I think um, explore, you know, go for it and, and try it if you're at that point. But I think just really be cautious. One, one little workaround I try to have people do early on because our, those, those scenarios and fantasies are so powerful and all these addictions, these arousal intensity addictions, chem sex and sex and porn addiction, uh, they're all about intensity and they're all up here. And I think if you can, uh, when you're having sex or even masturbating, if you uh, avoid dropping into the fantasy, drop, getting into your head, getting into some scenario or script or fantasy, but really stay present, drop out of your head, I, I really recommend getting in touch with your body. You can feel the sensation, enjoy the physical sensation, the touch, the, and it's all a slower pace. It's at a much slower pace than, than uh, this intense, um, addiction sex, but, but it's, a, it's, it's a way to kind of not fall into the trap of your brain hijacking you again and, and taking you off into that um, scenario that you don't want to end up at. But it's if you just really try to stay focused on your body and it, you're retraining your brain and your body actually how to discover sex again in a different way that's not been kind of hijacked by, by the addictive process. Yeah, um, this next one is a, is a very similar question, but from a, a different person. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it because there's a little bit of different stuff in here. Um, I've watched so much porn while um, PNP, party and play with party meth, play. or just myself, porn and meth, that almost anything in public, especially having younger fit guys uh, in, around, brings me into fantasy and cravings. Um, just tonight while watching the evening 
news um, and seeing our honorable military, the military guys triggered me. Um, I'm on day eight of being sober after most recently having around 100 days masturbation, even if I wrong, if wrongly using meth thoughts for climax does bring me some temporary relief and clarity. Um, what else to do? Question mark. So that's the question. Um, he's using meth to get out of those fantasies. Um, what are the other options? And then he says he's a big fan of your book. Um, no writing has so accurately detailed my life experiences of the past 15 years. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to read that last bit because we hear that a lot about David's book. So. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. I'm glad it was helpful for you. Um, you know, first of all, eight days, uh, probably the first two weeks away from meth, you're really kind of, you really just need to stay in crisis mode and, and take care of yourself and deal with some of those triggers we were talking about early on and, and uh, discovering some feelings and just really kind of finding your way, you know, because early on the, the skills uh, are about watching your denial system, you know, getting connected, starting to get a support network, maybe starting to lose some of the people that are uh, not so healthy for you in your life, that kind of stuff. So I would recommend at eight days, um, not masturbating, frankly, not, not even going there. I'd give yourself a little break from that because that at that point, I think you're pretty much guaranteed to drop into those meth fantasies if you're not careful. You just don't have enough distance from it. Um, I think what to bring clarity, I, I really am a big fan uh, to the extent possible early on uh, of mindfulness and, and physical activity. So exercise we know is a huge uh, way to uh, kind of stabilize your mood, to clear, clear your mind. Uh, it has the added bonus of releasing these proteins that actually help the reward circuitry, this, this limbic system in your brain that's been damaged by meth, repair itself quicker. So it has just a lot of benefits to it. Uh, with the one downside that sometimes an addict can become an exercise addict as well. So you want to be cautious about that. Um, but I think mindfulness at first, it's a huge, hugely important skill to help yourself be aware of what's going on, what are you feeling, and start to that little kind of five stage process I talked about at the beginning of this webinar, just kind of see where you're at in that, what's going on, do you have um, some distorted thinking, you know, are you jumping to conclusions, are you catastrophizing, are you, um, are you, is your thinking some way distorted? And I think that that's another way. Um, you mentioned triggers, it's just seeing guys, seeing pictures, seeing, you know, I've had many clients who would walk into a, a CMA meeting, Crystal Meth Anonymous meeting, and you know, there's a whole bunch of hot guys in a crystal meth anonymous meeting and, and that can be distracting. And so maybe the CMA meeting is not for them, but, but you know, we can't um, not see, um, you know, attractive people of whatever gender, if, if we're around, the same thing happens with sex and porn addicts, they notice people. And so uh, one thing we do with our clients especially early on is to, if they're starting to look at somebody and objectify them or think of them as a sex object, to really sort of remember that they're people and kind of try to Re rehumanize them. Um, in the case of uh, some of our, our straight sex addicts, you might see a, you know, our treatment centers in Southern California, there's a lot of attractive people out in the street and just the van going from our residence to the office, people see stuff all the time. Um, so what do they do with that? Instead of thinking, wow, you know, and then objectifying that person, they remember but that's, that's somebody's wife, that's somebody's daughter, that's someone's sister, that's somebody's mother, or, you know, just, it's, it's a real person. We kind of have to retrain our brains not to instantly objectify everybody. And, and this is a phenomenon that we see with meth as well as sex and porn addiction. That's why they all, I mean, they're very, very similar. And so uh, the, we, where this objectification occurs, we really have to uh, start to make people more three-dimensional. Di three and I would also, if you find yourself um, fixated on that to really break, break the spell, you know, look away and you don't want to kind of stay there and look and, and really watch yourself. Cause I think I, this is the only one I'll shut up. I've talked too much, but uh, so a lot of guys, whether they're sex porn addicts, whether they're straight or gay, um, have started, they stay away from porn. They stay away from some of the things that, um, they shouldn't be looking at, but they're really turning to Instagram and Facebook, which is full of you know, R-rated, if not sort of semi-X-rated pictures as all these people are, are um, all these validation junkies who are, um, what's that term they use for that? Uh, where they're uh, thirst trap, right? Thirst trap, is that it? Where the people are posting pictures to like get validation. Uh, there's a lot of stuff like, and so you, 
Social media is something I'd really limit early on, not only for that, but also because it really mimics the way addiction works in the brain. You're, you're actually being addicted to that dopamine hit as you go through your scrolls. So um, hopefully that's some tips there to, to be useful for you. Yeah, and I, I just want to add the biggest thing you can do when you're triggered to masturbate uh, instead of masturbating is what you're doing exactly right now. You were triggered, you came to a webinar, you're talking about it. You can also pick up the phone, call your sponsor if you have one, uh, call some friends in recovery. Hey, gosh, I was so triggered. Um, yeah, connect. Um, David and I talk about connection all the time. So, um, one, one more thing. I just remember that if you're a, a meth addict or a sex or porn addict, um, everything, everything gets translated into a sexual urge, right? So you can be really upset and that's the real issue. You're, maybe you're sad or you're depressed or you're angry. Um, and what happens? How does that get interpreted? You get horny and, and, the, and it's not sex. It's not libido that's driving that or sexual desire. It's an urge to soothe yourself, to medicate yourself. And so it's to understand that dynamic too, that to really say, this is not about sex. This is about me. You know, somebody else might take a drink or take a hit of something, but uh, sex addicts masturbate and camps like that to, to, to soothe themselves. So yeah, be alert to that too. Yeah, um, this next question, um, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna let David answer because he's gonna be a lot nicer when he answers than I would be. Um, if the addict could only select one activity to attend weekly, group therapy, individual therapy, SAA, et cetera, which one would you recommend and why? <laughs> David, please take it. <laughs> So recovery um, is not about like a Chinese menu, of maybe one from here, one from there. Recovery really requires a commitment. And I would say a meeting every day uh, is really important early on, if not two uh, every day. And you can't pick from one. I mean, if you're, um, they don't say what the addiction is, right? I guess it must be a sex addict. Right. So, you know, each of these things we talk about have different functions. So 12 step meetings are all about a, a pathway to recovery and give you group structure and give you fellowship and connection and some of that very important uh, avenue toward, uh, it's really step-by-step -step, literally uh, pathway toward, toward growth, but it's not therapy. You know, 12 step meetings are not therapy. We have individual therapy. We can work on our own issues, the deeper kind of private issues, we can work on trauma and in an individual setting, we can work on other issues that have led to our addiction or impacted our addiction. And group therapy is not either of those either. That's a whole third separate thing where, and I believe it's also a very important element, especially for sex addicts, because that group therapy, gender-based group therapy of men, right, or, or women, but I think that that's an important piece, but that's a facilitated group. 12-step groups are, are peer-led. But you got a therapist running a group, and that it's real, and it's it's um, it's very therapeutic. So my my uh, my answer would be to not frame it uh, like you have to pick one of those, but to really figure out how you can do them all. And uh, certainly, uh, individual therapy and twelve step program, I think, is, is essential. Uh, group therapy is really helpful, but uh, not everybody can do all that therapy. But I think that's that's what I would say to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to say, did you only act out once a week? <laughs> you know, I mean, come on, you acted out every day or at least five or six days a week. You can take an hour a day for your recovery. I'm done. I'm out. Um, um, I'm interested in writing something for a local publication about the chemsex experience. Um, as a community, uh, a gay community, as we're talking about, I find we don't talk about this pocket of gay sex culture nearly enough. Uh, there seems to be a severe lack of compassion and empathy. Is it useful to ask gay men to apply even an ounce of the compassion and scientific understanding we've developed for the HIV stigma to the meth stigma? Uh, In-group discrimination can be brutal. Um, good question. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with that. I think we, um, I live in a, as does Scott, you know, we live in on different coasts, but very gay communities. And th there's a surprisingly uh, lack of that compassion you're speaking of even here where uh, most people have either had a problem with it or no, certainly know somebody that's kind of crashed and burned on, on methamphetamine and some of that. So I think, yeah, there's a, there's a real issue. I think there's a little bit of a denial about that. I think um, there's a, a hierarchy. I've had clients who were not meth users but who were alcoholics 
who, you know, falling down drunk alcoholics with cirrhosis and unable to function and losing every relationship and just speaking so disparagingly about these guys, how could they do that to themselves using methamphetamine, right? So there's this whole like hierarchy of, like a junkie hierarchy, I guess. Um, so yeah, we need to really talk about that. I think, again, it's communication, it's awareness, right? People uh, need to know actually what this is about and how it relates uh, to the experience. Uh, whether you're gay, where I think, you know, meth, meth remember is, is a really powerful emotional painkiller. And, and uh, for guys who have some internalized homophobia or stigma or uh, have a hard time and the gay community is a pretty rough community sometimes, I think, uh, very stratified and, and can be pretty harsh, um, it, it can be a problem. And the same thing happens, by the way, with heterosexual meth use. Where do we see it? We see it in Appalachia and in the poor areas of the Midwest where people have um, lost economic standing where there's no jobs, all the factories are closed. Right? It's that same kind of thing. How do we just dull the pain? And, and so I think um, there's a stigma about that. It's a stigma about who uses it. There's a stigma about the shame of it that goes with it. And it's something we really need to, to remedy uh, that goes with, with it. And if you recall, and I, I was there uh, with the HIV epidemic, uh, there was a whole lot of stigma and discrimination back then too. It was a process. Uh, the, the community was not where they are now in the, in the 80s and even the early 90s. Uh, there was a lot of terror and shame and stigma about it. So it's a process, but it, the, the way out, I think, is just communication and awareness, teaching. And that's one of the things I really try to do in communities. Even community town halls are great. And then, by the way, there's a surprising amount of discussion. Every major city um, in the country has had meth town halls, a lot of meth awareness campaigns. and. It just kind of falls on dead ears a lot of times, I think. Yeah. And David has spoken at at least a few town halls that I've seen um, talking about this. Um, yeah, I think it was Harvey Milk who said, if you want to end discrimination, come out of the closet. Um, and, and I think that applies here. You want to end this discrimination about meth, talk about it. Um, so I encourage you to, to write the piece you want to write. And um, feel free to send it to me, uh, scott at seekingintegrity.com. Um, if you want us to consider it for our website, um, I'd be happy to think about that. Well, I'll just um, add, I'll, I'll put it in a plug for the, my, my, my friend who uh, wrote the forward of my book, Mark King, who's a, a GLAAD award-winning uh, blogger and, and activist and writer and um, who came out as a meth addict. And I think uh, it was, and after that he relapsed uh, and now he's got like eight years ago. But he, but the, it was so important that somebody that high profile people are saying, hey, I have this problem too. I think that's, that's huge. Thanks for that reminder. It's, it's really important. Yeah. Um, at which point uh, in healing from sex addiction would you recommend introducing brain spotting EMDR type trauma process? Um, is it useful if the addict is still in denial? Uh, okay, well, I'll answer that last one first. I don't, I don't think it is. Uh, I don't think EMDR is a very um, helpful technique. It might, I mean, if somebody is in such trauma that they, they don't, uh, they're not aware of their behavior, um, maybe a, on an outside chance, but really a, to, to effectively use EMDR or any trauma therapy really requires some um, st stability. I mean, I, as a therapist, and I do EMDR with my clients, I wouldn't take that up with somebody who's in active addiction or in denial just because um, you're dealing with, with old painful things that may or may not be remembered and certainly haven't been felt. And we're, what we're doing is, is kind of filing those away, you know, releasing whatever feelings need to be released. I mean, it, it can be tough work. And I don't even recommend trauma therapy right in the beginning of, of treatment or early sobriety. I at least get a couple months, in my opinion, a couple months of stability where I can teach the client how to control feelings and, and have some awareness and do some self-regulation techniques and, and all that stuff to kind of help them have a sense of control over what's, what's happening. So I think um, it, trauma really follows that breakthrough of denial and the early recovery and getting, getting people's um, starting to, to become aware and wake up. I think that's when trauma work can be really useful. You know, that said, I think um, with a few exceptions, trauma really underlies every addictive disorder of some, some form or another. And I think trauma work is really essential for recovery. It certainly was for my recovery. And, and I think for most people that I've worked with that really um, 
have a have at least an enjoyable quality of recovery uh it's really important to look at because that really not only does it kind of trauma lives in our our body's nervous system there's a physical component of trauma in our bodies but it also has framed in ways that we're not even aware of sometimes our ways of our assumptions about the world and and about our own safety and about our vulnerability and it it plays out in, in every fashion in our in our adult relationships and and our self-concept and everything so it's a really important bit of work to do but i think um i, I personally as a therapist would say if somebody's in denial i'm not gonna emdr is not the first thing i think of i think it really has to happen a little bit farther down the road yeah i mean the trauma work is painful and um pain triggers relapse. So basically the timing is get some solid sobriety and some solid support. Make sure you can handle the emotional impact of doing trauma work. And if somebody's still in denial, they're still pretty much in active addiction or even if they're not acting out, they're not ready for that. So yeah, um, I'm gonna pull this one out of the chat feature. Um, would you recommend that the addict share his circle plan with his partner? Circle plan, for those of you who don't know, um, is, is is the plan for sobriety that addicts use. The inner circle is the, the bottom line behaviors. These are my problem behaviors. The middle circle is slippery stuff that can lead me into the middle, the, the inner circle. So the middle area is thoughts, people, places, things, feelings, thoughts that are slippery for me that I need to be on my guard. And then the outer circle is healthy stuff that I can engage in instead of my addiction. So the question here is, would you recommend that the addict share his circle plan with the partner, um, specifically the inner circle, to be sure that all behaviors that the partner thinks are acting out are included there? Or should we partners stay away from that? Thank you. Um, so let's just stop with that part there. Um, yeah, good, 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 good question. Um, I, and Scott, I'll be curious to hear your answer about this too. I'd love to hear your thoughts. But uh, when I'm working with a client and their, their partner, um, usually in preparation for going home after a residential treatment, we, I recommend sharing the circle plan with, with the partner just so they have an idea of what, what's gone where. On occasion, there's been some really good feedback, uh, little tidbits that I might not have known or hadn't come up or hadn't thought about that the, the partner has some observation about something that might be a slight adjustment. But I think it's important for the partner to understand what, what's where in that whole concept because it's a, the circle plan is a wonderful concept for for individualizing sexual sobriety and and also to understand that it can the this that can plan can change in, in conjunction with the therapist and a sponsor over time to some extent it can be renegotiated i should say um but i think it's also important in those moments to clarify that it's not the partner's responsibility to police that circle plan or to be responsible for it or there it, it's more informational i think um and, and observational, and they can certainly, if they see something clearly not right, they can speak up and share what they feel about it. But but it, the, the purpose of that is not to say, okay, this is what I need to do. You know, you, you have to help me do it. Uh, it's really totally the addict's responsibility. But I think it's useful for the partner to understand what those what's in what circle and and why. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I completely agree with that. Um, if I'm working with somebody and an addict and he doesn't want to show a circle plan my immediate thought is, what are you hiding? <laughs> you know, why are you not sharing this with, with your wife or partner? What are you, what are you hiding? Um, and, you know, the partner does have a right to say, oh, and in this case, the question is about masturbation. Um, the spouse wants it in the inner circle, the addict doesn't. Um, you know, I think the betrayed partner has a right to say, um, I think masturbation goes in the, in the inner circle. Um, now, that doesn't mean it belongs in the inner circle. I think as a betrayed partner, you need to understand, hopefully, that that hopefully your partner, the cheating partner, has, has developed this circle plan in conjunction with a therapist and a 12-step sponsor, and there's been a lot of discussion, and if together they all agree that masturbation doesn't belong there, then maybe it doesn't, even if you're not cool with it. That said, if you're not cool with it, I think your partner should put it in there at least for a while and then rediscuss it in 90 days or six months. Um, you know, that would be my advice. I mean, that's very specific to your situation without knowing all the specifics of your situation. And, and Scott, can you just, without taking a lot of time, uh, explain why or how masturbation, or the rationale why masturbation might be in one circle or the other? 
Right, yeah. That, that's all, this is always the big question for sex addicts when they're creating a circle plan is where does masturbation go? Is it a bottom line behavior for me? Is it a slippery behavior for me? Is it even a healthy behavior for me? And sometimes it's all three, um, depending on how masturbation is used. Um, my suggestion is always err on the side of, the, of caution. Um, if you're not sure, start with it in the inner, inner circle. Um, you can always move it out later after thoughtful discussion. Um, and guys say, well, you know, I'll have physical problems if I don't masturbate and have an orgasm once in a while. I'm sorry, that's complete and total BS. You won't die. Not true. <laughs> not true. Nobody ever died from not having an orgasm. Doesn't happen. Um, but, um, you know, it, if it definitely belongs in the inner circle, if it's an a clear and active part of the addiction. If I'm a compulsive masturbator, it's got to be in the inner circle. If I'm a if I masturbate three times a day to porn, I probably need masturbation in the inner circle along with porn. But maybe later it moves to an outer circle, masturbation to healthy fantasies without porn. Um, sometimes, like a chem sex addict trying to retrain his brain away from meth fantasies might try to masturbate to a partner, an intimately connected partner fantasy, um, or might try masturbating with an intimately connected partner as part of the sex life. So, um, but usually it's, it, it lands ultimately in the middle circle where it's kind of something, it, probably not a bottom line behavior unless it is obviously, but, um, but it's slippery. It's something we always, as sex addicts, need to pay attention to, even if we're trying to use it in a healthy way as an outer circle activity. So that's a very convoluted answer to a question that really doesn't have an answer. <laughs> I think it's helpful. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, can you talk about the different parts of addiction? I don't know if I'm saying that right, but the triggers, the physical addiction, the road aspects like smoking after dinner and the habits. Um, maybe a little about the cycle of addiction or, or I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that one. Yeah, so I mean, it gets confusing. I think we, what we've done is kind of conceptualize, not we, but the, the field has conceptualized this cycle of addiction that um, I kind of hinted at it, the, the triggers leading up to acting out. But but basically it starts with with some kind of uh, trigger or thinking error, cognitive errors, uh, where we, sorry, triggers or cues, and then we sort of, you know, what do we do with that, how we interpret that, the, our thoughts, and it can lead to preoccupation, and then acting out, and then shame and remorse following that, there's, and there's different ways of conceptualizing that, but, but I think there's, uh, it all starts with, with kind of these uh, cues that come from the outside or inside, once we've trained ourselves to be sensitive to them, and then we, we take that and run with it, basically. Uh, and one thing about sex addiction and chem sex and porn addiction is that because they're so dopamine dependent, they're really focused heavily on the preoccupation. So a lot of times it's not, I mean, it is, but it's not ultimately about the sex itself, the orgasm. It's about the kind of the journey. It's why somebody can look at porn for six hours or eight hours and they lose the night um, and, and orgasm is kind of the end of it. But, but the, the dopamine is coming from looking at porn, not having the orgasm. It's the same with- The, the, the fantasy. The, the fantasy of it, right. Same with chem sex, same with sex addiction. Uh, sometimes people can uh, have a date with somebody, you know, a week or two weeks out and, and spend the next two weeks fantasizing about what that's gonna be like. And that's part of the high, that's part of the, the addiction itself. And so I think it's, we have to kind of broaden our concept of what, what the addiction is. It's not just the, the orgasm, it's, it's the whole process leading up to it and the aftermath the, the the crash that happens the remorse the shame the consequences you know and, and until it all starts again so i think there's there's different ways of conceptualizing that um rob has uh, in that uh book you the workbook has it explains the cycle in there doesn't it i mean most of yeah. Rob's books have a really nice clear cycle of addiction uh, layout with different stages uh, and i'd recommend his you know patrick dr patrick carnes who um, really was the, created the whole idea of, you know, sex addiction has a two like interlocking circle that's, it gets kind of, in my mind, a little bit complex, but I think uh, one circle. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, um, adjectives too, but complex. Sex addiction 101, the workbook, um, and also just sex addiction 101, the regular text, um, both have really good explanations of the cycle of addiction. I also wanted to bring up something you mentioned earlier, earlier, David, which is we do burn pathways into our brain. So smoking after dinner, yeah, we're smoking because we're addicted, but we're smoking after dinner because part of our addiction has burned a pathway into our brain. I finish dessert, I light up. Um, and it's very hard to break that habit, we, you know, because that pathway, is, it's, it's a deep groove in the brain. Um, and it's automatic. We do it without thinking. It's like somebody, you know, used the example of learning how to drive. I don't think about driving anymore. I think about getting from point, you know, how to, you know, the route I'm going to take. But somebody who plays guitar, you know, when they start, they're walking, you know, and then when they get really good at it, they, they don't look at the guitar. They don't think about it. They, it just happens. Or piano or um, smoking after dinner. It just happens. There's no thought. And I'll tell you the, the the risky thing about recovery is that those deep pathways never quite go away. They get kind of overgrown and not as deep and they're not quite as automatic, but they're still there. We can we can uh, rediscover them really easily if we ever get back into active addiction again. That's why people drop into where they were so fast if they were unfortunate enough to relapse. So um, we're at, we're out of time. We got a bunch of questions left. Where you know we obviously can't get to them today. But thank you, everybody. Save your unanswered questions for next These week. These are great, great questions. Yeah, yeah. What a what a good session. Um, we will be back. We'll be happy to answer them. So save them. Bring them back next week. Um, David, thank you, um, and uh, thank you all for being here. Anything you want to say to take us out? Yeah, just just remember, a relapse isn't about the relapse itself. It starts way way back, and you really need to have an awareness about that be conscious of it. Thank you. See you everybody next week. Take care, everybody. Good night.